One doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ.
as we close out 2023. God wants from us exactly what he got from us in 2023. He wants in 24. He wants your heart. He wants all of your heart. Love that, yay. <laughs> Take your time, they'll wait. Good morning. Lord, we pray for our children as they leave the sanctuary here. 
We ask you to be with them and their teachers and to fill their hearts with your love so that they may come to know you and trust you as their savior now and forever. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And now we're gonna pray because it's me. <laughs> we're gonna just start out with the prayer. Lord Jesus, I come here today because this is the day that you wanted me to speak. And so, Lord, I give up every word and every thought in my mind to you. Please let everything that comes from my mouth be what you want it to be. I ask you to put a hedge of protection around my weary body, and I ask you to bless the people who have prayed for me before the service and will continue through the service. Let this message touch all of our hearts and lead us into a closer life with you. I ask this again in your holy name. Amen. All right. So I have coffee up here. I have, I think, everything. <laughs> but most importantly, I've got God in here. And amen. Some way, he always gets through with this. And so I am very thankful for that. So today, let's talk about some of our announcements. Well, the first big one is the rededication service of, the, of our sanctuary is now postponed until next Sunday. And next Sunday, we'll have our celebration, our rededication for the next 200 years of this sanctuary, and um, we'll have a, a wonderful celebratory meal, a cake, everything. And so again, we'll see you here next Sunday to celebrate with us over God's faithfulness to the people of this church. Next Sunday, we were supposed to have the very first women's retreat committee meeting, but because it's the celebration Sunday, we're gonna push it off a week. So it, it'll be now on the 14th, um, and it'll be about 20 minutes after the service, and we'll do it in here. This is our Bible verse for the month of December. This is the last Sunday or the last day of December. So let's read this together and, and really take, wait one second, and take into our hearts what God has taught us about this verse during the last month. Okay, now. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another. And I hope that that's a verse that stays with you the rest of your life. So we do have in the, in the pews, <clears throat> if you're a visitor, we have prayer and contact cards. If you have a prayer request that you want the deacons to pray about this coming week, you can put it on this side of the card. And on the other side of the card, <clears throat> if you've been coming for a while, then we would love for you to fill out this part of the card so that we can keep in touch with you. We have a newsletter that we send out every other week. And, and we would just like to know who you are and why you're here and, and get to know you a little bit better. And when you, if you fill out either prayer and or the contact card, simply put it in the offering tray when it comes around later. This is the time of prayer, though, that we do in our church, and prayer is a very big deal in our church. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to read some of the prayer requests that I have right now already, and then I'll open it up to all of you who have what I would call serious prayer concerns that, that need to be addressed by the whole body. Um, again, if it's serious and you don't want to say it out loud, that's fine, then you put it on here and the same group of people will continue to pray for this. The first thing we need to do is, is pray for Pastor Joe and his family. Because again, this poor man and his family have been struck by COVID. And he's been quite sick with it. And David has also been sick and we're kind of watching other people in the family. So we really need to keep him in our prayers this week. We also need to keep Heather Downey in our prayers. This past week, although she's fighting cancer with more courage than almost anybody I've ever seen, she had to go back into the hospital because of numbness and inability to walk. And she's still in the hospital and they're still watching over her. And she'll be in the hospital at least through the weekend, probably through the holiday. So please keep her in your prayers. I also talked to Mona last night. She is still really, really suffering from pain. They have tried another pain-killing medication. It has had no effect on her back pain. She's not sleeping, and she, she has, they have told her they want her to go to PT, and they have moved up and given her the best date possible of January 16th, which is really a long way away when you have a lot of pain. So she would ask that we would pray that something opens up and she can go earlier and that they can find something to help allevi alleviate the pain that she's in. I also uh, got a, a prayer request through Brian, and it comes from uh, friends of um, Milka and her son David. Her friends' names are Usha and Nick, 
and their son-in-law died unexpectedly. He was only in his 30s in India, and, and it's going to make all kinds of problems because it's a half a world away, and they have a lot to do and a lot to worry about and think about. So let's keep Usha and Nick, that family, in our prayers. So who else has prayer requests? Yes. Elijah. Okay. Someone else. Yeah. I learned yesterday that my sister-in-law has been in and out of the hospital since Christmas Eve. She's, she has a diminished lung capacity due to years of smoking, which she will not give up. She's struggling. It's scary. Um, What's her first name? All right. Anybody else? Yeah, Mark. Okay. Want to do any, say anything else? Just pray for her. Um, okay. God knows what's going on. Okay. Yes. Who is this? What's his first name? Ed. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. No, I have a praise. So, to go along with all these requests, my father went to the hospital on Wednesday to uh, what I thought was a biopsy. Uh, and uh, they ended up going in and removing uh, what the doctor considered to Tired to work in his leather, and he is at home, and he is doing well and just as spicy as ever. If you know what I'm talking about. Oh, that's wonderful. Praise God. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It's always good to hear the praises. Yeah, Elaine. I lost a very good friend this past week. Her name was Carol. Uh, she lost her battle with heart disease, so prayer for her family. Yeah, Stu. Pray for a friend who um, he's got a serious fall. He's in Florida with his family. He's, in, he's just out of uh, critical condition, but he's in rehab right now. He's a head injury. And so we'd like to pray for him. And, and what's, can you give us his first name or not? Dan. Uh, say it again. Dan. Dan? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Marsha. We have a friend for my friend Connie with the breast cancer. Yep. Uh, she rang a bell on Christmas, day after Christmas. She's done with her treatment. She's considered cancer free. Oh, no. Praise God. <laughs> Wonderful news. All right. I, 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 okay. Yeah, and um, Alan? Yeah, I, I want to keep everybody praying for me, but I did get a job. Well, praise God. That's awesome. Praise God for that. Amen. Okay. All right. Last call. We're going to pray, and then we're going to end with the Lord's Prayer. Remind me if I forget. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning in in just so many different ways with so many requests and so much praise for all you have done and all you continue to do for those who love you. We pray for our extended church family. We pray for those people who have to stay home because they are not well enough or strong enough to come to church. 
In particular today, we pray for Pastor Joe and everyone in his family affected by this terrible, stupid virus. We ask you, Lord, to heal him and his family and to bring him back to his congregation as soon as possible, but to give him rest in the meantime. We pray for Heather Downey, who is hospitalized and fighting this cancer so hard. Please, Lord, give her doctor's skill and wisdom to treat her and let her find some peace and, and some relief from the suffering she goes through. Lord, we hold up Mona before you, and she is in so much pain. We ask you, Lord, to put your hand upon her and heal that pain, lessen the pain, take the pain away. We know you can do all these things, but we specifically ask, Lord, that, she, that because she has to wait for physical therapy, that you bring the date sooner, Lord, rather than later. We pray for Usha and Nick, who are, who, is, who are suffering a half a world away from where their daughter and son-in-law lived. He died this week very suddenly, Lord, and we ask you to help them comfort their daughter in India and to also find a way to bring all of them together. We pray for Lena's coworker, Elijah, who has t terrible digestion issues and can't keep food down. We ask for doctors who know and can find what's going on wrong with him and do it rapidly and help him. Lord, uh, we pray for Tracy, who is having lung issues and breathing problems, and we ask you to help her uh, quit the things that don't help her lungs, but also we ask you for doctors to help heal her lungs. We pray for Joni Hume, Lord. You know what is going on, Lord, and we place her into your hands, giving you control over her life that she has given you before. We ask you to be with her, to comfort her, and to give peace and comfort to her family. We also ask you for Lena's um, client, Ed, who, had, uh, who now has lung cancer after he's probably as a result of uh, being at the 9-11 site. Lord, uh, be with his doctors and give him peace and comfort. Lord, we have some praises too. We praise, praise you, Lord, that uh, Jim's father was in a hospital on Wednesday. They removed a tumor and he's home today. We ask you to be with him and to heal him and to give him more time with his family. We also praise you that Connie is done with her breast cancer treatment and we ask you to just watch over her and, and, and be good to her. And, and Lord, we praise, praise you for getting a job for Alan. This is what he needs and, and we just thank you for being faithful in this area. Um, we ask you, uh, before Carol, uh, for the heart disease she has. And we know, Lord, that you took her home this week. And so we ask you now to be with her family and her friends and to help them deal with this. And we ask you to be with Dan as he goes through rehabilitation, Lord, and just give him the strength and courage to fulfill all of this. Finally, Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And now let us go to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, drink of water. We're doing good. The prayers are strong. And we'll dive right into this. So the message today, and we'll just go ahead with some of this, is new. Just one simple little three-letter word, new. And so I want to kind of tell you how this all happened and how this came to me, because I think it's really important that when God works in our life that we share it with each other. Because I think sometimes... We're afraid to tell people when we know God has done something in our life because we're, we're not sure how they're going to take it, if they're going to think we're a little bit God crazy or something like that. Um, I actually tried to witness about something over the Christmas holidays to family that are a little bit not. And they did look at me funny, but I said, you know what, I'm planting this seed. And that's what I'm going to do with you right now. I want you to know how God kind of helped me with this message. So two weeks ago, I was here, and I thought it would be a long time before I would come back again, and that's okay. And so what I do, though, after the sermon is 
probably that afternoon or the next morning, I go, okay, Lord, what do you want me to talk about next? What should I start studying? And the, the answer that I got was this, rest and wait. And I'm like, okay, so I get a vacation, some time off, that's okay. It's almost Christmas, and then I had a tooth pulled, and then I got a dry socket, and I was kind of like, okay, this is a good time for resting and waiting, okay? Thursday morning, again, woke up, said my morning prayers in bed, and said to myself, okay, do you want me to start studying something now? My tooth is feeling better, you know, I think I'm doing okay, and I got rest and wait. And then one hour later, Pastor Joe called. Now, this is Thursday. I've been resting and waiting, just sailing on through life. And he calls and goes, bad news, I have COVID. And I go, oh, that is bad news. It's Thursday. It's Thursday. And so we talked, and we talked about what had to be canceled and what had to be done and everything else. And, and I just got off the phone, and I went immediately to prayer. And I, I have to I'll be honest and say, I was kind of like, you had me rest and wait? So now I have three days? to come up with a sermon. So I prayed and I said, okay, I need something and I need something fast. And this is what he did. Instant answer, new, like it was like right there in my forehead, new. I'm like, okay, that's not really specific, but I'm going with this because I knew that this was from God. So I sat there for a while and I prayed some more and I said, okay, new, what, what, what does he want me to talk about new? And I went, new year? Yeah, no, too easy, way too easy. And then I thought, maybe new life, but that's such a broad topic. It didn't feel right. New, new place, well, Jack and I have done that. We've moved, and we know what going to a new place is like. New job, uh, no, I've been, I'm retired. A new baby, definitely not. <laughs> Never happening again. A new idea, eh, that wasn't it either. And then, boom, new beginning. I'm like, that's it. And you know what, when you know it and you can feel the spirit within you going, that's it, we're running with this now. And I knew that. And I want you to know that everything I talk about today, everything I did today is 100% God. I mean, it is 100% God. He just put it in my head and I just put it out on a computer screen. So please know, this is not me at all. Okay, so new beginnings. That was what I came to. So I went back to the computer for a while and I just said, okay, I'm gonna put in new beginnings in the Bible. And one of the first things that I remembered was, wait a minute, two weeks ago, I talked about the fact that believers' lives change. And the title of the sermon three weeks ago was three days. And I said, sometimes God has things happen to you in three days. Thursday, Friday, and by Saturday it was all done. Oh, this is three days again for me. God is gonna be with me in this. And I said on that day, believers' lives change. Once you are a believer, once you follow Jesus, your life is gonna change because his needs for you are going to change. And when that happens, you will go where he needs you to be. That's why Jack and I ended up here when I swore I would never leave my house in Connecticut until I was dead. And then he moved us here. And I think I'm still alive. And so I thought some more and I said, well, this kind of sounds like what I did two weeks ago. And, and then it was the God in my head saying, no, it's not, because I don't want you to talk to individuals today. I want you to talk to your friends. I want you to talk to your family today. I want to talk about the church family today and about change and new beginnings within the church. And I actually made a slide to kind of match the other one and we'll put it up there because this is the verse that kept running through my head the last three days. And this is God speaking to Joshua before the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River and went into the promised land. And God tells um, Joshua this command to, to, the peep, to make to the people. God says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then I rewrote that sentence and took out the I and the me in it, and, and I rewrote it this way. It said, if we follow Christ, if we as a church follow Christ, he will lead us where he needs us. And then I went back to that first Google search I looked at, and there right near the top was an article entitled, Five Things the Bible Says About New Beginnings. And I'm in need of some structure at this point. And this is done by Billy Graham. 
And I'm like, well, you know what? He was one heck of a good preacher. I'm going to go see what he talked about. And so I went and looked, and it was a little devotional. It was three quarters of a page. And he listed five things that the Bible said about new beginnings for churches. And then he gave a Bible verse for each of them. So I had a structure, and then I could build on that structure and add the things that God put in my heart about that. But I want you to know that when you see number one and what that sentence is, that's right from Billy Graham's little structure that he gave me, and I am so thankful for that. So the first thing that he had on the list was new beginnings happen in seasons. New beginnings happen in seasons. And the verse he gave is this one that everybody, I'm sure, has heard, and it comes from Ecclesiastes 3.1. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. And I have to tell you that I absolutely adore living in New England because of seasons. I love the change. I, I don't think I could live you know, in the deep south where there is no snow and it doesn't get cold and all the leaves drop off the trees. I don't think I could do that because I love to see the changing of the seasons. I love after winter and being cold and miserable, especially when it gets muddy. I love to be able to see the little green things in my garden coming up. I love all those kinds of changing of seasons. But the second part of the verse I had to really think about, and that part of the verse says this to me, there's a time for every matter under heaven. Sometimes I want things to happen right now. Sometimes I want to have a solution right now. But sometimes God says, it's not the season for that, it's not the time for that. And sometimes he says to us, even though we're not ready, now is the season for that. Now is the time for that. It's time for you to get ready. It's time for us to get ready as a church. I went back and looked, and looked in many places in the Bible where it talked about seasons, and I found in Genesis 8, in chapter, chapter 8, verse 22, um, this is God talking to Noah after the flood, after they've come out of the ark, they've built an altar, they've talked to God, and God promises Noah and his family he will never again destroy the entire earth with a flood. He promises that. But at the very end of the promises God has given, God says this, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, spring and, that's spring and fall, cold and heat, summer and winter, and he actually says, summer and winter, day and night, shall, shall not cease. God is telling us he set up the world with seasons, and he wants us to look at the seasons and understand that our life is going to have seasons too. And so this is the one time, try my mouth, uh, the one time I'll try to talk to you about seasons in terms of just me. And so I, I had to go through all the seasons in my life, and Jack and I talk about seasons a lot now, because there's a lot of things we've done together over the past 50, I don't know, 50 some years we've been married, 52, 53 years we've been married. There were many seasons in our life but I kind of started at an early stage with me. So at age five, I know this is gonna shock you all, but I could outrun any boy on the playground. I really could run at one point in time. Then about five, six in that area, I became a Christian. Not the kind of Christian I am today, but the kind of Christian that says, I believe that Jesus loves me, that he came to die for my sins and I'm forgiven. So I was pretty young to be a Christian. Sometime in, in probably middle school, I became a cheerleader, a water skier. You're all going, this woman can't possibly. A water skier. I became a student, a writer, a teacher. I became a wife, a mother, a snow skier, way too late in life, killed myself about. A grandmother, and after a grandmother, I became a scuba diver, and then a university professor. So these are all the things, you know, some of the things that I had. And I wanted to do it this way because guess what? Some of these seasons are gone. I will never be a snow skier again, or a scuba diver, or a university professor, or a cheerleader, or a runner. I have to just tell you one funny story. So many, probably eight, 10 years ago, we were playing wiffle ball in the yard, and we, the grandsons were like, oh, Amma, you can get up and bat. And they were sure that they could strike me out. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll strike out and go sit down again. So Amma stood up with the wiffle ball and they threw a lobbed a stupid pitch at me and I nailed that ball. And Nate goes to me, Amma, run! <laughs> well, if you haven't run in a while and you tell your brain to say run, it's kind of like, <laughs> I couldn't. I said, Nate, you run for me. 
And he's like, okay, Amma. So, yes, runner is gone. So the reason I did this and crossed out some of these things is I want to show you that there are things in your life that are seasons. I am not sorry at all I had any of these seasons. I look back at them with joy and with good memories, but they're seasons. But there's other things on that list that I have been and will be always. And so there's both parts of your life. You have things that are seasons and you have things that, that are gonna stay with you hopefully until the day that you die. So, and I go back to this verse that my dad taught me because of our last name. So my, un, my unmarried name, my, uh, what would they call that? Maiden name. Maiden name, thank you. <laughs> my maiden name was Palmbach, a German name. Palm, like palm tree, and Bach meaning brook. So my name meant tree by the brook. And my father very early brought me to this verse and he said, this is our family, a tree planted by the brook. And he said, this verse in Psalms, is about how a righteous man or woman should live. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. So that's kind of like my verse of my family, and it's something that has stuck with me all my life. I am planted near the living water of Jesus Christ, and so I am able in season, when it is the right season, to do anything God asks me to do including doing something like this on three days' notice. Again, it's all God. But I want to go back to talk to you about churches going through seasons. And I picked up the church history book, and if you've not seen it, we do have extra copies that you could borrow because it's a great book that explains everything that's happened in the past 200 years. And I found out there were some wild seasons this church went through. In fact, we divided as a church because of where this church got built 200 years ago. Some people wanted it here, some people wanted it at a far distant location in town, and people actually left because of that. Interesting. We also had people that disagreed about the temperance movement at one point in the church, and that caused problems. Abolition was debated. Now, never in the church did people say um, that slavery was good, but how it was going to be treated was discussed for many years. Um, I didn't put up there, there was also the Civil War in this church, two world wars, and a variety of other wars since then. The service of women in the church has evolved and changed over time in this church. But I think I was most surprised by the seasons of multiple seasons of revival. When you look at the history of this church, things seem to be going bad, and then God has swept back in, and revival has come to this congregation. People have poured in, families have poured in, we, they've had, they had multiple um, people joining the church, and if that doesn't sound like something that's happening right now to you, then you haven't been here enough to see that's exactly what's happening now. Our last class of people that came in was like 16 or 17 people joined the church, and there's more people that want to join still. And so God, I think, is leading us into another area, another time of revival, another new beginning. If I go back to the Bible again, I want, to I want you to understand that churches have seasons also. No church ever goes, has everything go smoothly, ever. And to know that, all we have to do is to look at the seven churches of the book of Revelation. So Revelation is written by John. He is a prisoner on Patmos, and he is given visions by God about the church and the future of the church. And in, in in chapters two and three, I believe it is, he lists seven churches um, that are in Anatolia, which today we would call Turkey. And he, he talks about some of the problems and some of the seasons that they are in. So in Ephesus, he said the church of Ephesus is missing love. They have stopped loving Christ. And if they don't love Christ, they don't love their fellow man and they're very ineffective. The church at Smyrna, he didn't find anything spiritually wrong. And this is Jesus in a vision talking to John and telling him to write this down. Jesus said the church at Smyrna is under significant physical persecution. They're hanging in there. They're not, maybe not growing, but they're hanging in there against persecution. In Pergamos, or Pergamum, however you want to say it, there is, look at this, this is a church. This is a new Christian church. There is idolatry, immorality, and cults going on. And in Thyatira, there is also idolatry and immorality. That is, I don't know if you want to call it deep winter, but that's one heck of a season for two churches to be going through. 
In Sardis, there was, the church had little faith and therefore it had very few good works. They weren't taking care of their, each, even each other, more or less anyone else. Now, Philadelphia was a very strong, a very small church and it had little strength, but the people who were in it had tons of faith. So they were coming into a new season. And the worst church, according to Jesus, was Laodicea because they were lukewarm. They warmed, in, in my mind, lukewarm always means you warmed the pews on Sunday and never came through the door after that. That's who they were. So all churches, even the churches of the Bible, go through seasons, and sometimes the seasons are tough, and sometimes they're exciting. The second thing that Billy Graham talked about in terms of new beginnings is this. The end is more important than the beginning. Hmm, I had to think about that one for a while. And these are the, the verses that he gave um, from Ecclesiastics, verse 7 and 8. In 7, it says, I mean, in 8, it says, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Now, I had to think about it. What is the end thing that this church should be doing? Oh, please. What is it? Glorifying God. Glorifying God and doing, as Pastor Joe keeps telling us, doing kingdom work, doing kingdom work to bring others into the kingdom of God. That's what we should be doing. So that would be the end of the thing. So the question always is, well, how do we start that? What's the beginning of that? What does it look like? And we're learning in Ecclesiastics that the better is the end of the thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So that, this was convicting to me because I'm the kind of person that's like, I want to make this decision now, we're going to do it. We're going to make this decision now, and then we're going to do it. And God was telling me, you know, sometimes it's not the right season. It's not the time to be doing these things. But sometime it's going to be the right time, and then it's all forward, not just come some of it. It's all of us going forward, doing what God wants us to do. And that reminded me of a story in Acts, and it's a story about Paul and Barnabas. The kingdom is the end goal. It always was for Paul. It always was for all of the people who went out on missions trips. The end goal was getting people into the kingdom of God, spreading the gospel, and having people believe. And there's little Judy. There she is, for those of you who watch for her. She's watching this whole thing. And let me explain kind of what happened. So they're in the city called Lystra. And in this city, this is the first time they have been there, Paul and Barnabas. And normally, when Paul goes into a city, if there is a Jewish synagogue, he will go to the synagogue first, and he will preach or teach in the synagogue, hoping to convince the Jewish people there to come to faith in Christ. This time, he starts talking to people in the street. Now, I'm not saying what he did was wrong or not wrong, but it kind of explains what happens. And he's walking up and down the streets, and he's talking to people, and he walks by a man who's a cripple who's sitting there, and he can feel that the man has faith and belief already in Jesus. So he stops, and he puts his hands on the man, and the man is healed. And the man stands up in the middle of the crowd and walks away for the first time in his entire life. Well, the problem is that the people standing around are not Christian at all. In fact, they are multi-god worshipers. They are either Greeks or Romans. And they believe in multiple gods, and they believe in gods who sometimes come down to earth in earthly form. And they look at Barnabas and they go, you must be Zeus. And then they look at Paul and they go, and you must be Hermes. And they're like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. We're here to talk about the one God and his son who was sent. So he starts talking to, they start talking to them and kind of talk them off of offering that bull for sacrifice and throwing flowers on them and treating them like gods. And as Paul starts to go into the gospel message, this is what he says. He says to them, in past generations, he, meaning God, allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, he did not leave himself without a witness. So he's saying that even though you never heard of the one and only God, even though you haven't heard about Jesus yet, God showed you he existed by the world around you. So he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and with gladness. So he calmed all the people down. Happy ending story? No. Because the people in Antioch 
heard, the Jewish people in Antioch heard that he was close by. And they took a whole bunch of rabble-rousing people from Antioch, came to Lystra, worked the people up, and does anybody know what happened at, in, right at the outskirts of Lystra? They tried to stone Paul to death. He was saved. He went on to another city, but he returned three more times to Lystra. And why is it important that he returned to Lystra? Does anybody know who lived in Lystra that was so important in Paul's life? His name was Timothy. That's where Timothy lived. He had to go back there. Timothy was like a spiritual son for him. So even with a misstep in the beginning, God makes something good come out of what happened in Lystra. The kingdom is always the end goal. Number three says, the former things pass away and all things are made new. And I keep, I, I myself, so like in the middle of the night when I'm really hurting and I know nobody else is awake, I sit there and go, someday I'm gonna be in heaven and my back isn't gonna hurt, my ear isn't gonna hurt. <laughs> and I think about those things and I hold on to them because it's a promise that God has given me and I know that day will come. So let's see what verses were used. And so I got to this reading the Billy Graham thing and I went, oh my gosh, this is the verse that I used at the end of the sermon two weeks ago. It's tying, and then, and then I knew it was tying everything together. So there was three sections to this verse and this is Isaiah. And this is God speaking to Isaiah, telling Isaiah to, to use these words to other people. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Now, I'm taking a dangerous path right here, but I'm doing it. Because I want you to start thinking about us as a group of people that form a family here, a church family. And so I'm going to ask you in your own heads, take a look at everything we are doing as a church. Just take a look at those things in your head. Second part of the verse. God is talking to Isaiah. God is talking to us. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you see what God is doing in this church? He has brought new families, young families, single people, elderly people, people with special needs, people who are sad, people who are full of love for him, and people who desperately need him. That's the new thing he's doing in this church. And God says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Impossible things in my head. Impossible things. Not, not something any of us could do. God can make miraculous changes when it is the season for those changes within a church. And so, does it look familiar? Yeah, it's this church. And it is Christmas Eve. And so I'm going to talk about how not good I am sometimes. OK. So there, there's a single lady sitting there like bottom, the bottom middle, long hair, you can tell it's me. So Jack has already got up from the pew and got back here because he has to turn the lights off in a second. Pastor Joe has just said, turn your candles on, Remember, if those of you who are here. And the, the praise group is up there and they're ready to sing. And I pick up and I open my bulletin and this is what Judy thought. Oh my gosh, we're singing Silent Night first. Everybody knows you sing Silent Night last on Christmas Eve. Do you know how petty stupid that is? And yet it bounced into my silly little brain. Have I ever done that kind of thing before? Oh yeah. About seven years old, you see my mother and my grandmother always had me wear white gloves to church. I thought it was like a rule. So I go to Sunday school one day and there's this new kid, this new girl in Sunday school. And so I'm sitting next to her, and so I just let her be known. I said, well, if you come back next week, you better have white gloves. <laughs> and quite honestly, I can't tell you if she came back or not. I don't remember. But I remember with embarrassment that I was so snotty to her and said something like that. I w I'm, I'm being honest with you now. I remember walking in here the first time, and there was somebody in jeans and a T-shirt. And I was like, holy smokes, what's going on here? <laughs> now we have a pastor who preaches in jeans sometimes, and it's perfectly okay. I remember being 
totally grossed out going to my parents' church and having people do this. I do this now. I do this now. One of the things we have to come around to, guys, is what can't be changed? What are the things that are the core beliefs of us as a congregation? And what are the things that we just need to let go? And so instead of trying to get a list of what do we need to let go, I wanted to come up with a list. These are the core things. These are the only things that matter to God. Who God is and the work of the Trinity. That the Bible is, in, is the inspired words of God and not one word can be changed, ignored, or overlooked. That the, the only way through salvation is through Jesus Christ. That man is born sinful and that is who he is and he needs saving and that comes through Jesus Christ. And as believers, we need to worship and to pray. That's the core. That's what we all need to believe in. The other stuff is inconsequential. It is. It can't, we cannot let other stuff divide us. Whether we sing, sing two hymns or three praise songs or where they come, it doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus and the gospel. Number four says per perseverance is the path to new beginnings. So that word perseverance, I figured we needed to talk about for just a minute. Perseverance, if you take per, it means through, and then severance here means through suffering or through severity. But let's look up at the actual um, original definition of the word. The original def definition is abide by something strictly. Put the word live in there. Live by something strictly. I live by my Christian faith strictly. Perseverance is a 100% word. Like love is a 100% word. You, you can't love 50% of the time or 75% of the time. You can't persevere 22% of the time. It's a 100% word. And the other thing about that saying was the idea of a path. We are on a path. A path means we don't set our butts down and sit right here and just wait for all the blessings to flow right over each and every one of us. We start walking on a path. And as we walk and go further along, he will take us where we need to go. It is not a matter of just sitting. It's a matter of moving into his will for us. So I took the verse that, that um, Billy Graham had, and I actually decided I needed to put it into um, a, a translation that everybody in this room would understand. So this is one I chose from the message. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit, all the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course, to those, to those who persevere. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That's because God cares. He cares right down to the last detail. That is who God is. So we must learn to move forward carefully. And this is, again, this is a verse, a set of verses that I pray often. It's from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil, straight ahead carrying the light of Christ. And then I'm looking at this and I go, this is the wrong picture, Judy. This is the right picture. We are doing this together. And I can remember going back and just saying this, these verses again, praying these verses again in a different way. Let our eyes look directly forward. Let our gaze be straight before you, Lord. Let us ponder the path that you have our feet travel. Then all our ways will be sure. We will not swerve to the right or to the left, and we will, with your help, turn your foot away from evil. That should be our prayer today. That should be our prayer as a church. Number five, we're getting near the end now. A new beginning can start right now where you are. And all of a sudden, I started looking at this verse because this one kept coming up in everything else I was studying from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. There is tons of new creations in this room. And God is telling us, Jesus is telling us, that the old has passed away and behold, the new has come. This church family is God's creation. He put us all here for a purpose. I believe that the old is passing away and the new is still coming to us. A new beginning is coming to us. You see, this sanctuary was actually dedicated 200 years ago tomorrow. But the 31st was closest, so that was the date we picked for the celebration. I, I got this feeling that he wanted us to walk into a new beginning with our pastor next week, talking about the new beginning when it really was 200 years and when we really restarted the new 200 years. This is the last day of the first 200 years of our sanctuary. God has blessed the people of this church and he certainly has blessed us. Tonight, you see, the clock is going to come down. Uh, we won't have a ball falling. We won't have stuff going off in the, the guy. In fact, it's probably going to be as quiet as this is Christmas night, taken from the, cam the, from the uh, cameras we have around the church. This was Christmas night, three minutes before midnight. When the clock finally counts down tonight, I ask a question of you, and I ask a question of myself. Could we, as a church family, perhaps be on a path for a brand new beginning, a new season, something that God wants us to do, that we agree to do for him and with him forever? I end with Revelations 21.5. I started out in the beginning talking about Genesis and about Noah talking about or learning from God that God always will have seasons for us. But this is in the second to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelations 21.5. And this is being said to John, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is what Jesus wants to do for us. He wants to make you new. He wants to make this church new. He wants us and everything in this world at some point to be new. Also then, he said to John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is a promise from God to us. There will always be new beginnings for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we walk with you into the changes you have for our individual lives as well as the new beginnings you have for your church here in North Brookfield. Help us cling only to what is true and to work together in all things for the growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.
songs to my final breath Let the weight of this whole world go Gonna be no tears, gonna be no shame When I see that smile on my Savior's face I won't be walking, I'll be running Thank you, Lord, for being with us, and thank you for protecting me and for giving me a message that I could never have done on my own. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Let's pray over the offering. Lord, we return to you now just a small little bit of what you have given each and every one of us. Take these gifts, Lord. Help us use them wisely to grow your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is 811, Another Year is Dawning. If you're able, please stand and sing. benediction from this for this morning comes from Ephesians 3:20, one that we often hear but uh, it talks about the church and that's why I included this now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Lord, as we leave here today, help us to see the new beginnings and the seasons you are bringing into our church. Help us prepare for with joy and trust that you will lead us according to your purposes. Help us to be agents of change to the rest of the world as we joyfully bear witness to your love and salvation to others 
this week and forever. Amen. Happy New Year.